morning. A very warm welcome to the first uh, Aneridia Europe webinar. Good morning. My name is Ivana Kielsgård and I'm the chairman of the Swedish Aneridia Association. I'm also a member of the board of Aneridia Europe. There are about 100,000 people living with Aniridia in the world. And this week we celebrate the Rare Disease Week, tomorrow the Rare Disease Day. Aniridia Europe was founded a number of years ago with the aim to join forces of the Aniridia associations in Europe and, and the community to bring awareness to the community and engage science and the medical community to work together and improve the quality of life of Aniridia patients around the world. This year, we are launching a set of seminars uh, that are trying to bring together the community, trying to raise awareness, trying to also disseminate the latest knowledge and developments in the medical community, and of course, to engage everybody to, to uh, work together and improve the quality of life for the Aniridia patients. This first webinar focuses on Aniridia Net, and it is news from the frontier. And today we have two distinguished professionals and, and experts in Aniridia, Professor Nila Gali, which is from the Department of Biomedical, um, uh, Biomedical and Clinical Sciences from Linköping University, working with experimental ophthalmology, and Professor Dr. Klaus Kursifen, which is the chairman and professor of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Cologne. Very welcome. This is, of course, a live sent event. So um, you will be able to um, pose questions during the event, uh, depending on where you uh, watch. Is it on YouTube or is it on the Media Europe website? And at the end of the event, or towards the end of the event, we will, of course, bring the questions. So our technical team, with the support of Lucia and Matteo, will also then pose this, the, the questions uh, to our guests. And we are also recording this event uh, in order to be able to, uh, for, to, to enable other people to view the event later on. So before we start, we would like to show a short movie that was of course, developed um, as part of the Aniridia uh, Net project action. And it was, of course, uh, thanks to Juliana, Dr. Juliana Martinez at the Tienza, who is responsible for the communication of the action. And then, of course, with the support of Dr. Grubcheva uh, from, from Belgium and many people from the community, Aniridia community, they also participated in the, uh, in the movie and, of course, Aniridia Europe. Aniridia is a devastating eye disease affecting 1 in 80,000 people. It is characterized by a complete or partial loss of the iris, causing reduced vision and increased sensitivity. Aniridia is more than a defect of the iris. Patients can also suffer severe ocular problems. These eye problems contribute to a progressive vision loss and blindness. Aniridia is a birth defect. Although the disease mechanism is not well understood, it is known that aniridia is caused by mutations in the Paxis gene. A non-functional Paxis gene can lead to a disrupted ocular formation affecting several eye structures. Aniridia is a rare disease and this rarity poses important clinical, regulatory and commercial challenges for the development of therapies and diagnosis techniques. Can present a broad diversity of symptoms and given the lack of clinical knowledge about the disease it is often initially misdiagnosed. Currently, there is no existing effective treatment of cure for aniridia. With the support of ongoing research efforts, 
things can change. We can find more answers. We can provide solutions for them. We can improve their lives. With research, possibilities are limitless. Be part of the change. Aniridia, it is a rare disease, but the patients with aniridia, they are not rare. They are just unique. Aniridia is a disease which is easy to diagnose and at the same time is very difficult to diagnose and also manage. The most important thing is our patient. So all our efforts are dedicated to allow them to have normal life. Without research, there is no future for aniridia treatment. Therefore, we set up a cost action, including specialists from all over Europe. And we hope that with our research, we are going to contribute to understand this disease and help our patients see better, feel better. So please help us doing this. I have an iridia. Together, we are stronger. I have an iridia. We're real, but together, we're strong. We are rare. Contactize us. We are Help us shape our future. Help us shape our future. Help us shape our future. But together we are strong. Help us shape our Help future. Help us shape our future. Yes, and welcome back. And of course, Dr. Uh, Christina Grupcheva is from the Medical University of Varna in Bulgaria, not Belgium, as I said before, sorry. Uh, but now we start our little chat, digital discussion, and I would first like to ask uh, Professor Lagalli to introduce a bit himself. Sure, thank you, uh, Ivana. Um, I'm uh, working at uh, the Linköping University uh, in Sweden. Um, and um, my main area of focus is cornea, cornea research. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, corneal disease, uh, corneal um, wound healing, um, uh, regeneration of the cornea, and of course, uh, corneal imaging and uh, aniridia is a big area of interest of mine. Thank you. Um, Professor Kursifan, you also work with keratopathy and with many aniridia patients. Yeah, also good morning from my side. Greetings from uh, Cologne in Germany. Uh, my name is uh, Klaus Kursif and I'm a, a cornea specialist, ophthalmologist and uh, a professor here at the Department of Ophthalmology in, in, in Cologne. And uh, I personally and our, our group has been involved in corneal diseases for quite for quite some time, also in, especially in, in patients with, with aniridia. And um, we are happy to be part of this coast uh, action on aniridia. Thank you, welcome. Um, we could say, I think, that uh, Aniridia Net is currently the biggest project in the world that focuses on Aniridia. And uh, it is uh, really a, a great honor to be part of it. Uh, but Professor Lagali, you were one of those that was an in initiated this action. Can you tell us a little bit about the background and, of course, about the action itself? Sure, thank you. Um, yes, uh, first of all, it's really great to be here today with you and uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Kersifen, uh, representing the COST uh, and Iridianet. Um, and I uh, would like to also welcome all the viewers today. Um, so yes, um, this uh, and Iridianet, well, there was actually two sort of main reasons um, that it grew out of, and I'd like to call that the perfect storm uh, that came together at the same time. 
The first was about uh, 10 years ago, um, my uh, mentor, uh, Professor Fagerholm in, in Sweden, was asked to be a uh, opponent on a, on a PhD thesis defense. And that defense was being done by uh, Ulla Idén uh, in Sweden. And uh, her topic was Aniridia in Norway and Sweden. And so uh, after this uh, thesis uh, defense, uh, Professor Fagerholm became very interested in the subject of Aniridia and uh, we decided to start a project uh, on aniridia and lynch hooping, and it just grew from there. Uh, we started looking at aniridia uh, cohorts in Sweden and Norway, and then it expanded to the rest of Europe. Um, so I think uh, one one message there is it's very, very important uh, who you choose uh, as an opponent on your PhD uh, thesis. <laughs> uh, the other the other event that came um, around the sort of uh, overlapping with this was a previous cost action that was led by uh, Professor uh, Kersifen, and, and he will uh, talk a little bit more about that. And that action was uh, on corneal regeneration. It was just ending, uh, and we needed uh, Kersifen, to and, and try to uh, talk, um, sustain all the knowledge um, that and, and the network that we gained from this. Uh, so uh, we decided to uh, choose Aniridia as a topic for a new uh, for a new uh, cost uh, network, which was subsequently granted. So this is sort of how we came, uh, how the Enridi net uh, came about. Fantastic. And you had, um, uh, uh, one time you explained to me that you had a meeting uh, closing this previous action and that you chose an Iridia. And uh, it was really, um, I think at the same time we also met uh, and then started, uh, you asked us to join the proposal and that was really fantastic to be part of it, of the of the, this trip. Um, but at the beginning of this action, uh, there were about 60 participants um, and the, 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 there are many different types of European projects uh, focusing on specific topics uh, or like this cost, which actually has a, has a different aim so how many participants are there today? How many uh, member countries are there today? Yes, so we have uh, today, uh, the cost action has grown to, um, from the initial group of about 60 um, in the proposing group, uh, we have over 200 members uh, today and uh, we have 30 uh, countries represented. So it's quite a large uh, number of countries um, in and around Europe uh, who are, are represented today. So this is this is really great that we could grow uh, the action to this size. Um, what would you say, if you just summarize the expected results of this action? Well, um, Aniridianet um, basically focuses on bringing together this critical mass of um, clinicians, researchers, but also, as you know, patient organizations, uh, uh, and their members uh, and other interested parties um, to work on. We have specific uh, goals and deliverables and uh, we will try to uh, achieve those during the course of the action and th the point of those is to uh, ultimately uh, improve the lives uh, of those living with Aniridia. Mm. So, uh, you know, one of the big uh, advantages of this action is that Aniridia is a rare disease so we need to bring together enough people uh, in order to work uh, together to bring about change. So some of our activities, for example, some of these deliverables um, are a consensus on the best medical advice for treatment or uh, documenting the quality and life situation of, of people living with aniridia, uh, but also technological um, advancements such as uh, stem cell technologies or regenerative therapies. Um, these are just a few examples. Um, Professor Kursifan, this is really, um, the, as, as, as Professor Lagali said, there are a lot of benefits in being part of this action and you have experience from a similar action before. Uh, what would you say are also the challenges of being engaged in this kind of project? I mean, that's the, it has pros and cons. This, is, this concept of the cost action is a very old, it's probably one of the oldest funding instruments of the European Union. Um, and the, the overarching uh, aim when it was established in the early 70s was basically to bring together um, people from all over Europe and to bring together people from all kind of disciplines and to basically support networking on a European level. And I think this has been very successful uh, funding tool over the years. 
And as you mentioned, we had been lucky before in um, uh, 2012 or so to to start another coast action on, on cornea regeneration, artificial cornea, which also worked uh, very well and which was basically the, the, the previous coast action we were both involved in. And I mean, the benefit is that it's a very open um, um, form of uh, collaboration. So you can have people from all over Europe, also from Israel, from several other affiliated countries. Um, it, you can include, as you mentioned, industry, patient organizations. So it's a very open tool. It has the benefit to bring together people, to create new ideas, to to train the next generation of uh, of students, of physicians, of researchers. The the drawback basically is that it's basically also only funded as a networking tool. So we don't get um, really uh, the money to to do the actual research. So we get we get to know the people, we get to form networks, we get all the good ideas, uh, we have involvement. But then we have, in addition, um, um, to be able to obtain funding, additional funding, to do the real work. So that's basically, uh, probably Neil, you would agree that's a challenge because um, this network is a fantastic tool. So you get a lot of new ideas and projects. Um, but uh, in the end, to bring them to the street, basically, you need additional help and tools and funding to make this happen. So it's, it's a great tool, uh, but it also has its uh, challenges. Yes, uh, the main challenge would also be to, to actually proactively work for uh, creating spin-off projects that, uh, that, that focus on the ideas that are generated in the cost action. Yeah, that, that maybe I can add something. That, that's something where, where he also was very successful in the past because from the previous cost action we were able to, to, to get this uh, arrest blindness large uh, European Union project which actually brought the money on board to do the the actual research and that's probably something we will also hope or we already had some success also so that this coast action is like like a like a seeding ground on which other things can can grow in in, in addition in the future and already have grown yes very interesting and and can the professor yeah. Gal yeah, sorry, completely agree. Just want to reiterate that, yeah, this is a very, a very good sort of launch pad for, for, new, uh, for new funding applications for the actual research. So I think the key with the cost is getting together um, the interested parties in a very specific area, and, and then they together will then um, apply for the, for the research funding. And it's been a very successful model, I think, not only for us, but for, for other actions as well. Yeah. 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 Professor Legal, you've also mentioned that it also allows you to uh, to um, uh, invite uh, professionals and, and scientists from other parts of the world uh, to different conferences, events, and so on that can also contribute to the exchange of of ideas, knowledge, and of course uh, um, facilitate um, cooperation in the future. Yes, this is true. Uh, already, we've had uh, you know we've had exchanges uh, and in, and. Uh, 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 discussions with uh, our colleagues in the United States, in Canada, in Russia, in, in other countries. And I guess it's, it's our hope that even this action will be expanded well beyond the borders of, of Europe. And I think there it's also key that the patient organizations, who also have a very broad reach today, uh, can, uh, can enable this as well and bring in those other associations which exist on a global scale. Uh, so that um, I think just the more, you know, the more people we are, the, st the stronger we are, the stronger our voice is. So uh, I think it's my hope that the action will even grow uh, larger over time. Yes. Um, the, Professor Korsivan, you there are a number of working groups uh, in, in the action. Of course, the action cannot just be focusing on networking, but uh, you, you, you've defined the very um, application stage different focus areas that the scientists, specialists and, and, and people that are engaged in, in the action uh, can, can get together and discuss. One of them is the working group four, which focuses on transplantation, inflammation and immunity related to an iridia associated keratopathy. And keratopathy is a very well documented um, challenge for aniridia eyes. Uh, so, and of course, if, if, it, if it is mistreated, can easily also lead to blindness. Uh, but part of this working group is also to analyze best practices. Um, how far have you uh, come with this work? Um, 
Can you tell us something about about uh, that working group and how it goes? Yeah, that's, that's as you mentioned also one challenge of the the coast action format that you have a very diverse group and you have to bring them together into smaller groups which um, um, combine people with with similar interests. And um, as you said, one important area is to um, translate also the findings which have been made into into clinical routine and that is usually done via clinical trials and by combining clinical expertise and especially for rare diseases such as aniridia it's very very difficult to um, define best practice patterns because the the published evidence is so um, limited and everybody has his own experience and his own small um, horizon and that's why i think the the coast action is a great tool to bring together people from in this case all over europe to to share this this is work in progress um, unfortunately also like everything else we have been uh, kind of ha hampered by the uh, by the pandemic in in recent times and the 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 regular meetings we had the last meeting i think just a year ago the last exactly. i mean in, in person meeting um, so everything has been slowed down a bit, but I think that's, that's on a good track. And as you said, it's it's a very tricky uh, area. We we could talk we could talk hours about, but I mean, the the probably the there are some some key messages I would probably try to convey that obviously um, uh, coronal transplantation in Andalusia is a very challenging and very difficult uh, task. Not in terms of 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 technology but more in terms of, of outcome and of complications so it should be only done if if we, it should be always only done in an individual case decision only if really necessary only if um, if, if nothing else can be done it should optimally optimally be combined uh, with uh, with the stem cell uh, therapy before if this is somehow conceivable and then it should be done in any way in a lamellar fashion so we should try to avoid to exchange the the whole cornea whenever this is possible only in, in emergency cases and try to do lamellar repair surgery so we only replace certain portions of of, of the cornea so the minimally um, invasive approach is always um, the best and it should be always discussed in, in great detail with the with the individual patient what is the uh, what is the expectation what is what are the risks what is the, the benefits and that is a very uh, personalized individualized decision and that's also making it some what what difficult in terms of these guidelines to uh, to put this into a categorized um, table. I mean, obviously, there are general recommendations, as I just made some, but uh, that, that always will depend on the also on the on the circumstance, on the age of the patient, on the environment, on, on multiple um, instances. But to, to come to come to an end, so, so we are we are I think we are on our way, but that's that's still there's still work to be done. So, but that's that's work in progress. Yes, uh, well, it is actually it is exactly one year since we met uh, last. And uh, I can say that uh, it, it is always so interesting, and it's it's a sort of a pleasure to uh, to be at these meetings and to experience uh, this exchange of uh, experiences, because that's also one part of the uh, of, of the action that you will eventually come with some some sort of recommendation and best practices. But uh, at the moment, since it is so rare then uh, the practices differ between different countries and different even within a country and with the different uh, hospitals. So then uh, it is also an idea conferences and the cost action. It's so interesting to see when you start discussing really these very practical medical uh, treatment methods that work or don't work and so on. Um, I think that uh, I think that it's also interesting to mention, as you mentioned, we, we met in our last physical meeting uh, at the end of February last year in Lisbon. Uh, since then, we've had a, an online meeting via Zoom, and that happened in October of 2020. And I think there was about 40 people or so uh, in the management committee from mm -hmm. COST, just the management committee, uh, who met. And there was really a lot of um, interest and engagement there. But I should also mention that even though we don't have the, the regular large meetings, maybe once or twice a year, uh, there are a lot of smaller meetings and uh, day. To, actually, I have a, we have day to day, um, uh, you know, discussions with each other, and we have a lot of uh, messages going back and forth. And um, right now, we're working on um, some some important uh, review uh, articles. 
and what Professor Kersifin mentioned just about this uh, importance of this consensus when there is limited um, evidence in the literature, this is sort of what we're trying to address now. And um, so even, even though we don't have the visible meanings, there's a lot of work going on in the background and hopefully, you know, that will come out very soon uh, so that, um, so that we'll get, you know, get this inf important information out. Mm. Uh, Professor Lagali, there's um, one of the main um, working groups uh, in the Enria Net focuses on developing common clinical guidelines or recommendations that would be actually like they could harmonize both the examinations and treatment methods for Enria patients. And this work is uh, is led by uh, Professor Dr. Dominique Brenmorgignac from France, but in it engages a lot of people. And, and both many competences. And of course, this is a very difficult work, as uh, Professor Kursifin said, the many things, many articles, but again, limited because an iridia is so rare that one needs to take into account. And there are also representatives of an iridia Europe that are engaged. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about this work, about the progress and um, when can we expect the guidelines to be published? <laughs> sure. Uh, yes, this is, of course, a, of interest for many, many different people. Um, yes, as you mentioned, uh, Professor Raymond Guignac in Paris is leading this uh, work. And uh, the goal here is, is to provide more of a consensus, uh, a consensus at, more at European level, because one doesn't exist today at that level um, of, you know, best practices in uh, specifically in aniridia management um, and, and specifically as you mentioned and Professor Kersey mentioned because there is a limited amount of uh, evidence in the literature today but there is a lot of knowledge and ex expertise that exists in various centers and this has not necessarily come out in the published literature but there are a lot of practices that are being followed and, and good advice to be given and so forth. So this is what we try to uh, capture, what intend to capture in this consensus uh, documents sort of European level. Um, so uh, this is important because, you know, there is a lot of knowledge known about what uh, interventions work and what interventions don't work. Uh, in Anaridia, and it's important to communicate uh, that knowledge. So yes, as you mentioned, we're, we're working on this. We would like to get this done in a short time frame. Of course, um, as Professor Kirsten mentioned, uh, the pandemic has sort of uh, changed our timelines a little bit for this. Um, but the uh, goal again is to uh, have this consensus. And, and as you can imagine, it's it's a difficult task to uh, come up with a consensus document because there are so many people involved with different viewpoints and different experiences. And so this is a time consuming task um, but we are all sort of motivated to do this. So um, the goal is to get it done within the time frame of yes. the current cost yes. action. Yes. Yes. Um, as, and as I have also understood, there are many new ideas that are emerging as well uh, during this process. And the new, there's a lot of spin-off effect of that, new articles and so on. So um, as long as there is some action even partially coming out, or some results even partially coming out, that is, of course, benefits the Aniridia community and Aniridia patients. Um, Dr. Kursivan, there's um, one thing about these European projects. Uh, is also, uh, it's, it's not very easy to win. That's the first, there's a lot of competition for that. So uh, one needs to also show that there is some innovation involved, that one is trying to also, of course, push the limits, develop new things and so on. Um, and there is one working group that also focuses on uh, regenerative methods, which I think many uh, people with aniridia are really interested in, uh, is the, uh, the you know, working with these instead of treating the result, uh, well, in, in, instead of treating, uh, but also working with re regeneration so that we can back out these, the progress of an idea. Um, can you talk about a, lot, a little bit about this work? Yeah, I think there are several um, very interesting uh, approaches in the, in the area of regenerative medicine, also with a special relation to an iridia, which are uh, discussed and which are pursued uh, within the action. I mean, there's certainly one very big aspect that is trying. Uh, so, if you start with the with the uh, corneal involvement of the disease, is uh, trying to prevent the devastating long-term effects of the limbal stem cell uh, deficiency, so the energy associated keratopathy. So, working on um, 
uh, yeah, prophylactic tools to treat the limbal stem cell deficiency, for example, via gene therapy or, or stem cell transplantation or other um, aspects. So that's certainly very interesting and also um, yeah, hopeful area of, of research where we would expect things to improve, not in the next year, but in, if you talk about a um, midterm um, perspective. And I think there are very interesting things going on. I mean, um, just to one example, which is um, somewhat related in, in, in Germany, there is a, uh, a clinical trial which is already ongoing where um, um, a special form of stem cells are, are transplanted, ABCB4 plus stem cells, which are um, thought to be not um, immunogenic, so they, which are thought not to be um, dependent on systemic immunosuppression in the long term, um, and which are um, um, generated from uh, allogenic donors, so which would also potentially be amenable to uh, enteritia patients where we don't can take the stem cells from the healthy eye to the other eye. So that's something which is already in 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 a in a clinical um, testing period. Other things are very early on um, in terms of gene therapy on the on the cellular level, trying to um, prevent long-term effects. So I think it's a that's a broad spectrum, and I think the good and the, as as you said, the difficult aspect is with the cost action that it's so so broad that. Um, um, there are a lot of things at different levels which are which all have to be moved forward and have to be brought to a positive end. That's a, a very challenging task for the the action chair and the leadership team to to uh, uh, put this somehow into channels which are coming to a productive end. But I think there are level, several um, interesting things which are which are going on and which will eventually benefit um, benefit in the clinic. Um. Yeah, I agree uh, totally, and uh, I think also um, some of the work uh, also that uh, P Professor Kersifin's team is working on um, could also be important because this is to support the whole environment of the stem cells, for example. So it's a lot of um, work is going going on in, into the actual stem cells themselves, but it has to also be realized that the stem cells uh, are working in concert with the immune system as well. So immunomodulatory um, therapies are also important. And these could even range from just simple pharmacological uh, therapies uh, to promote the survival of stem cells um, to, um, for example, dampen the immune response uh, in the cornea. Uh, and there are a number of different um, approaches that have been used in the clinic and that can be could be applied uh, to aniridia. So, um, I mean, these are some of the areas as well that we're uh, also focusing on. It's very, very interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can I mention one more thing where actually, as you know, Aniridia Europe also was very supportive. Is um, that uh, it's also uh, interesting to try to uh, to stop the, the devastating vessel growth in, in yes. Aniridia or maybe even uh, make them go away and that um, in the, in the previous uh, coast action and in the previous European Union project, we were able to show that certain forms of UV cross-linking can stop vessel growth, uh, maybe make vessels go away, and that also with Aniridia Europe, with the help, we are now currently um, applying for a clinical trial in this direction, which would potentially also be helpful for patients with Aniridia to, to stop the vessel growth or make vessels um, Go away. I think that's also a perfect example of how um, the interaction between patient um, support groups and and research can help move things hopefully forward in the in the in the mid term or long term. Yes, it's a very very interesting. It's extremely interesting to follow. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one thing that is also very important is to uh, to be able to diagnose. Uh, in in a common way, uh, the progress of keratopathy, for instance, for the uh, associated keratopathy, and you have been working in developing these diagnostics um, for some time now. Uh, but it is very challenging work, as I understand. It's very challenging to to to, to define these um, um, protocols for diagnostics. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that I think is very very important also for the patient to know and to, with, secu with, with security which stage uh, the keratopathy is in. 
So one of the things we've been working on uh, with um, examining different uh, cohorts of um, uh, people with aneridia around Europe is um, to better um, assess the keratopathy, for example. And uh, one of the one of the um, uh, sort of main findings we, we've had and we've been trying to um, communicate more is the importance of clinical genetics, first of all, uh, because um, uh, there are over 500 different uh, unique PAC6 mutations that are known uh, that these are causative of aniridia. It doesn't mean that there's one size fits all. Um, and, and indeed, we see that there's a lot of um, differences from, uh, from person to person with aniridia in how their disease expresses and how it progresses. Uh, so it's very important to, uh, one message is to have a proper clinical genetics examination done so we know exactly what type of mutation um, is present uh, because this can um, affect the prognosis. Uh, we could know if it's an aggressive type of keratopathy or not. Um, secondly, um, a common grading scale for the keratopathy is very important. And I think we're working, we're, we're getting there, we're working uh, towards that direction um, because I think we all have to first speak the same language yes. in order to be able to know what we're talking about and develop uh, further. Uh, so the other and then other point I wanted to make is that um, more of a, a realization is, is starting to emerge now, and we need to keep working on this, that the keratopathy is a lot broader than just stem cells and um, what one can see on the eye. Uh, for example, we know that there are problems with inflammation, uh, that are present. We know that the nerves are affected in the cornea. We know that there are tear film deficiencies. Um, and so um, these all come into play. And I think we have to have a broader view uh, as well of the keratopathy. And so diagnosis um, should involve um, many different modalities. Mm. So I think this is what we're sort of working on. Mm. Uh, Professor Kostin, you, you meet a lot of patients as well. So I can imagine that this would be very, very useful also to have. Yeah, certainly. I think, as, as Neil said, it's, it's um, I think one very big prospect for the future, I think, is the genotype, phenotype, yes. um, yeah, let's say, yeah, individualized or more, more personalized approach that we really know what we are dealing with. So that's, that we don't have a big basket, which we, where we put a sign on, but we say, okay, this is this, is this form, this sub form, so that will make everything much more precise. And the other thing, as you also pointed out already, is that it also in terms of imaging and, um, and, and quantification, we are already we are only at the beginning on how to um, image and quantify changes, both in terms of nerves, in terms of stem cell involvement, of epithelial changes of vessels, and how to grade this and how to more precisely make make a prognostic. Um, uh, um, uh, statement on this and also how to uh, base the therapy on this more individualized approach. So I think that's really, really only at the beginning at the moment. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. Uh, like I said, we in Anedida Europe have also identified the genotype phenotype study as really our top priority uh, because it would be very interesting to understand better the connection between two, these two. Um, I think we go a little bit, time really flies, <laughs> so I think we go a little bit about um, short questions because I know that many of our um, uh, members of the community are curious about this, some questions that keep arising and that uh, will probably be interesting for them also to, to uh, get an answer to. For instance, one thing is that you mentioned this um, a couple of years ago, there was a common recommendation that even from, from birth one should use moisturizing drops. Uh, just because there's a problem with the tear film and the tears uh, in order to prevent the progress of eventual keratopathy. Is it still sort of a recommendation or should one wait until they're really needed? So we don't have the European consensus on this no. yet. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, consensus finding takes ages anyway, even without coronavirus. So, um, so I can only say what we do. So, I mean, there's no, it's not really... A, the, hard evidence saying that you can prevent things by doing this but on the other hand the, the children uh, which we take care of we we still have them on on uh, some form of uh, lubricating eye drops yes. most of them actually and um, a little bit depending on what kind of 
how the, the, the ocular surface uh, appears, if it's more like the, the, the fluid phase, if it's more li lipid uh, deficiency or both. So actually most of them are on, on some form of lubricating um, therapy. Yeah. Um, would you say there's also a con many people use contact lenses? Uh, and uh, of course this um, latest recommendations that one should avoid them. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think contact lenses are good in in in, in um, let's say in an emergency situation, or if you have if you have really epithelial defects, if you have in corneal erosion, um, the contact lens can help on a short term basis to calm things down. But in actually in several severe ocular surface diseases, such as in aniridia, also in ocular in GVHD after stem cell transplantation, there are more detrimental long term effects of the contact lens. So that's certainly not something one would recommend on a long-term basis. What one can think about is uh, the use of the, the scleral lenses, which are not directly in contact with the corneal epithelium, but they, they only sit on the conjunctiva. So you have a fluid pocket between the, the corneal surface and the, uh, the contact lens. That's something one can, uh, one can think about, which also helps to correct uh, astigmatic changes of the of the surface, especially after after surgical procedures. But the normal uh, bandage contact lens we would not not really recommend on a on a on a long term basis. But it can be helpful on a, uh, if acute problems arise in the, the short term. Short term. And uh, this is now uh, the pandemic. Many people are wondering: Should I really take extra care? Would uh, the corona pandemic affect me in a different way than others. Have you seen anything of this that we should actually, that we could send as a, as a recommendation to, to our um, uh, is, the community? There is actually something which, which is called, um, what's in English? Uh, it's called mask associated dry eye disease, uh, which is, I mean, it's not really, it's not a ICD classification yet, but I mean, it seems that uh, wearing of a face masks, especially if they're not perfectly um, um, aligned yes. to the to the nose here, that you have constant blowing of air in a non-conventional uh, way, that can uh, um, uh, aggravate a dry eye, which is uh, anyway present in in aniridia or in other patients. And additionally, it can also increase with uh, that's, that's, that seems to be true for contact lens patients. It can it seems to be able to increase the risk of, of infectious diseases of the mm -hmm. ocular surface because you uh, more uh, you constantly blow um, uh, bacteria from the uh, from the nose uh, onto the ocular surface. So I would probably advocate um, a more um, a little bit more aggressive lubrication of the surface and to be especially careful if there are defects of the ocular surface or if somebody is if using um, or has to use uh, contact lenses. I think that would probably be the one recommendation uh, to give. Yeah. And if possible, wear, wear glasses because we have learned that wearing glasses um, reduces the risk of the coronavirus infection statistically because obviously you, you don't, not so many viruses land on the ocular surface and are then drained uh, through the nose to the, um, to the pharynx and, are, um, and cannot cause uh, infection. So wearing uh, glasses actually seems to be protective. This is very, very useful. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, I think like yes. Yeah, sorry. I think something also that's come to light uh, in the pandemic time, and this is generally not not only in the energy population, is that uh, there's we've seen a lot of increased screen viewing time yes. uh, during <laughs> the pandemic, and so this is something to to keep in mind as well because it's generally, you know, bad for eye health. Uh, with extended screen viewing time, and and one could imagine in the Enridia population who are already predisposed, for example, to dry eye, um, that this could be particularly important to keep in mind, especially for for children. A lot of children tend to spend a lot of time on on screens as well, so uh, something to keep in mind. Yes, I I fully agree. I can see with my son that the screen time has increased. So. <laughs> Um, but before we, we let in the questions from the audience, uh, just one more question to Professor Lagali. Of course, the Aniridia Europe and the patient organizations are involved in this action. 
Uh, and as I said before, it was really a dream come true to be able to join the, the, the uh, proposal in the beginning. And of course, when, when it was approved, it was really, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, but there are also some challenges. How do you experience this um, cooperation? Yes, yes, of course, uh, there, there are always challenges. I mean, there's challenges uh, on, on multiple levels because, of course, we are located physically in different places. We, uh, uh, we, we do things in different ways, um, have different priorities and so forth. But, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of we have to uh, keep, uh, keep the momentum going, uh, you know, and, and so far it's been very good. Um, uh, keep... Um, keep the motivation going even in this pandemic time uh, and I think uh, some of these common projects are, are really helping to do that because we really need the input of many different experts and uh, so they have been willing uh, to, um, to, to, to give us their time and expertise and I think uh, this is a big, uh, we have to give a big um, call out to all, all the, all the um, participants in our cost action who have been really dedicating a lot of time uh, to helping us achieve our goals um, during during the pandemic, so that's even though it, it's always a challenge to to um, to to have a large uh, network to to accomplish uh, concrete goals. Uh, I think um, many of our members are are very dedicated uh, in this way, so um, we're very pleased about this. Yes. <laughs> It is nice. Uh, we'll see if Matteo can uh, join us. Lucia and Matteo have been working in the background, collecting questions. Good morning, all. Thanks, Good morning. Ivana. Morning. Good morning. So uh, from uh, the, the audience, uh, there are some questions uh, uh, that were coming, but uh, more or less uh, you have already answered. However, uh, one of them uh, is uh, corneal corneal transplantation how successful are they in this moment uh, and uh, um, which uh, moist tourism, tourizing uh, drops uh, are recommended uh, to use uh, or what else is there to be done uh, about uh, the uh, dryness of eye and uh, about this uh, also in this period as uh, you uh, were saying before uh, in the COVID-19 period. So, so maybe I start with the with the last question. So, um, in, in terms of treating the, the dry eye in in um, aniridia, that's there are also some general uh, guidelines which one probably should follow. One is obviously not to use uh, it's always to use preservative free eye drops. So no eye drops which contain uh, preservatives because they can aggravate the the damage to the uh, ocular surface further then is the other guideline is to um, um, try to combine eye drops which um, re replace different layers of the tear film so it's always good to combine for example uh, a hyaluronic acid uh, component of the uh, exchanging the, the, the water layer and combine it with something which explains the, the lipid layer um, um, uh, on the top of the of the tear film um, and the third advice would be to um, combine this usually with some form of ointment um, in the evening uh, to to protect the ocular surface overnight which can also be something more more viscous in addition uh, i think we, we, we touched this or, or neil touched this before briefly um, obviously it, it's on the long term also good to think about additional um, approaches for the for the ocular surface um, changes and that is in terms of um, how can we reduce the inflammatory changes and that can be uh, on a short term uh, topical steroids but that's no long term therapy uh, long term therapy can be done with topical cytosporin um, a eye drops which can be given also uh, already in, in in childhood and it can be uh, used to to reduce the, the inflammation of the ocular surface and the third aspect, which also Neil mentioned before, is that we, we come to know that there are also changes in corneal nerves um, in, in uh, aniridia corneas, and that can be addressed, for example, with uh, serum um, eye drops or with 
again, we had very new development uh, in several European countries with very high the viscous hyaluronic acid eye drops, which, which also seem to have neuro protective or neuro um, supportive um, effects. So this would be the three um, approaches targeting the tear film or supporting the tear film uh, instability, um, anti-inflammatory therapy, and then approaches for uh, strengthening the corneal nerves, be it with serum eye drops or with other um, tear replacement um, drops, with, which are more viscous than, than before. Very interesting. Um, there was one more question with respect to transplantation, I uh, think, Matteo. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah, okay. yes. There was uh, the, a, a question about uh, uh, how it is going the um, the result uh, uh, from the corneal transplantation. Uh, what are uh, uh, the best practices to follow in this moment uh, under the surgeon uh, point of view? Yeah, that's also something which we try to find a consensus on. But I mean, to, to, to say in general, it's it's very difficult. The, the prognosis is very difficult for, especially for penetrating keratoplasty, because we have uh, inflammation, we have uh, stem cell deficiency, we have um, a very uh, inflammatory milieu. So that should be avoided, I think, whenever possible. What one can do certainly is, um, especially in in central um, areas of opacification, is to to perform surface. Therapies like um, lamella keratectomy, removing of superficial scarring <coughs> tissue. Uh, this can be combined with amniotic membrane transplantation, which is <coughs> also an approach to stabilize the surface, to regenerate corneal nerves. And that is, uh, I think, a valid approach which can be discussed on an individual, individualized basis to remove um, central superficial uh, scarring. This can be combined topically with um, local anti VGF therapy on a short term. Um, that's one approach. The other approach, which can also be discussed, is to perform superficial uh, exchanges of tissues if there is superficial scarring with vascularization. This can be done with a relatively good risk-benefit um, ratio. What I would um, avoid, as mentioned, is to perform penetrating keratoplasty unless it's some way in combination with the limbal stem cell transplantation, because we know that the prognosis is very, very guarded. What a relatively new development is on top of this is the, the use of the artificial uh, cornea, uh, like the Boston keratoprosthesis. That's in itself not something new, which it has been around for 40 years or so. But um, there are some relatively recent studies showing that um, also in eyes with aniridia, uh, which are very challenging uh, in this uh, aspect of transplantation, the artificial cornea can provide at least some uh, form of visual acuity uh, centrally and with all the risks of this artificial cornea that has to be very precisely discussed on the you know, individualized patient basis, uh, artificial corneas can be a way to um, uh, give some form of visual acuity on a medium term range. So that's, that's certainly nothing which we would recommend children or young patients but that's something which can be discussed uh, for older patients um, to uh, improve uh, vision. And the, the outcomes are relatively good with all the, as I said, you know, with all the risk which has to be, have to be discussed. But that's at least one, one, one new, relatively new option, yeah. Instead, always from the audience, uh, but uh, from an external point of view from the cornea, so about the contact lenses, uh, there are two questions uh, that we can uh, um, summarize uh, in one. So the, the topic is uh, how the long-term use uh, of uh, contact lenses uh, can impact uh, on, the cornea, on, on the cornea and uh, what uh, can we do to uh, solve uh, or uh, improve uh, or uh, benefit the, um, the status of the cornea, uh, starting from the fact that uh, uh, the, the aniridia people need to use uh, these uh, uh, contact lenses. And uh, always about contact lenses, uh, uh, what do you think about the, the use of the therapeutic uh, lenses uh, always uh, in the long-term use? I mean, as said before, there are detrimental or, or there are 
negative side effects of the long-term use of contact lens overall, and, and especially in, in eyes which are um, which are having difficulties anyway, like in, in aniridia, that is, you get more damage to the nerve, you get more inflammation, you get more dry eye. So there, there are negative effects. As I said before, that has to be um, balanced uh, on an individual basis. So what is no, you have to t what are the, the, the benefits and the risks? And if the decision is made that there are that it's necessary to to wear contact lens both on a therapeutic level or also on an optical level, then one should try to at least minimize the risks which are associated with it. And that means that one should um, obviously take care with the hygiene of the contact lens, but also do everything what is possible to stabilize the surface. And that is to combine the contact lens then with proper artificial tears with proper anti-inflammatory therapy, for example, also long-term anti-inflammatory therapy with, with uh, cyclosporin eye drops, and potentially also something which stabilizes the corneal, um, corneal nerve. So um, do as much as possible to stabilize the surface if contact lenses have to be worn on the long term. Last question from our audience is about COVID-19 and uh, the possibility or, or impossibility to reach uh, good uh, um, good doctors uh, or uh, good therapies uh, to uh, fix problems like the dryness of eye with the masks. So according to you both, uh, uh, what could be the three advices uh, uh, to monitor uh, or uh, check <laughs> the situation of eyes in uh, aniridiac people? in this period? So, I mean, if, if, you are not, if you don't have access to the uh, eye care doctor in person, which in some parts of Europe may be the case in the moment, uh, I mean, obviously one option would be to try to have uh, online consultations or video consultations. That is an option, at least in Germany and in some parts of Europe, uh, that, can, that, can, um, that can help. And otherwise, um, I mean, that the best is probably to maximize the therapy you already have at the moment in terms of lubrication um, and uh, hope uh, that there is uh, light at the end of the tunnel in the relatively near future in most countries in Europe. I hope so, at least. Thank you so much, uh, Ivana. I leave you the, the word. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lagali, would you like to add something? <laughs> No, I think it's. Uh, I think uh, Professor Kersifan has summed up uh, very, yes. very well. Yeah. Um, well, time is really flying, and uh, we still need to start wrapping up. Um, but I am really interested in about the future. And th th if we look in the past, uh, one of the spheres of medicine that has developed really among the fastest is ophthalmology. Uh, what would you expect in ten years' time that we have achieved? And this is a question to you both. <laughs> Okay, I, I'll take it first, I guess. Um, yeah, so I think, and this is something we're working towards today, I think in 10 years, and it's been in, improving over the last few years, I think we'd like to see Aniridia as, as a, established as a well-known clinical entity uh, among, you know, doctors everywhere. Um, also, um, the next generation of younger clinicians and researchers that they're aware uh, of Aniridia and um, that they are working on new techniques to manage the disease in, in, in the best way possible. So I'd like to see that sort of even improving in the next uh, 10 years um, so that it's, a, it's still a rare disease but not an unknown disease by any means. Um, and then I think there's some very exciting developments that I think we will see some improvements in the next uh, in the 10 year time frame. Uh, and we're already starting to see some first indications, you know, that these could be new potential drugs, um, potential uh, cellular cell therapies, or re as, as Professor Kernsevin talked about before, regenerative therapies um, that could perhaps halt the disease, uh, at least the keratopathy, and try to preserve uh, a good level of vision. Um, so I think, um, yeah, there are some really exciting developments, and I, and I hope in 10 years we'll really have approved therapies for aniridia, for the keratopathy. Uh, House, would you like to add anything? I think I would only uh, completely agree, and I hope that, as we all know, I mean, in research, you always have to try 
hundred uh, times to be successful one time, or not, maybe not that much, but that at least one or two of the um, very promising approaches will make it to the uh, to the clinical routine in, in ten years. But I'm very optimistic about this. Um, I was like asking one question because it starts sort of uh, um, uh, developing the thoughts. Is if if we're going to really reach and get there. What do we need to do more of and what should we do less of? Well, one thing I think we can do more of is what we're doing now, for example, with the cost action, uh, that this really critical mass has to be sustained. And I think even now we should be looking for ways to continue past the uh, duration of this cost action, see how can we keep this, uh, this group or this uh, sort of mass of expertise going um, beyond. So this is this is something we really should be looking at, I think, uh, as one thing. Uh, would you like to add anything, House? I think that that's really the main challenge in the next one or two years to be able to find a structure on the European level, preferably uh, where we can, um, as you said, ma maintain this fascinating uh, group uh, of expertise, of knowledge, of exchange, and um, keep uh, going. So. Um, that's, that's the challenge for the next one or two years to find a suitable tool to continue this endeavor. Ivana, if I yes. can, there is uh, another question from our audience uh, that is yes. uh, related to sunglasses. So how is the benefit that they bring to people uh, outside and inside? And uh, if uh, is better to keep uh, them also inside, for example, in your house or in uh, other spaces inside? We can start. I mean, in, in I mean, if you if you talk about sunglasses outside, obviously in terms of UV protection, that is certainly something which is conceptually beneficial for the ocular surface anyway, and especially if it's if it's a um, endangered ocular surface, because we know that UV light is damaging to stem limbal stem cells anyways. So that's I would say certainly beneficial. Although I'm not sure that we really have very hard uh, um, scientific evidence for that, but I mean. Con Concluding from other aspects, you would say it's beneficial. Inside, I think it's only um, helping potentially to reduce stray light or other irritating effects, and that is basically on the individual level. So if 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 you think um, that is it, it helps you, so it makes um, it makes vision more um, comfortable. Yes, uh, and if if not, then no. So I think that would, in my opinion, it's really something on the individual uh, level which has to be decided. And uh, another question is uh, uh, about... Just, uh, 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 Matteo, just a second. I think, do you, Professor Lagalli, do you have a uh, response okay. to just like you, Yeah, I would just like to um, uh, point out or ask uh, Professor Kersifin, what about for youngsters with uh, whose eyes are still developing? Would there be any um, sort of recommendations for that? I mean, uh, the importance of light, um, natural light, um, could this affect um, the decision to wear sunglasses? That's a trick. It's a tricky question because we know that um, we, we need, or our eyes need, in the first years, um, a certain degree of UV light to um, um, reach the normal, uh, to, to for the, for normal eye development. So if you don't have enough UV light because people, are, uh, children, are too much inside and uh, stick too much to the smartphone, then they get. Uh, elongated eye growth, uh, get myopic, and um, so that there has to there's a fine balance. We don't need, to, we don't want too much UV light because that can harm the ocular surface. Uh, but we also want children, especially, to be outside to get some form of UV light. But the UV light we need, or the, the eyes of the children need for normal eye development, that's something which you can even reach on a on a cloudy day. So you don't need full screen uh, sunshine. Um, that, that's even sufficient if you if you are outside on a on a not on a rainy day but on a on a cloudy day. So um, I think if you if you recommend sunglasses in in heavy sunshine or if you are in the mountains or at the seaside, I think that's better because then you protect from heavy UV exposure. But normally you, it's not necessary because then you get the sufficient UV light which we need for for eye growth development. And, and would you say also that it's important to, I mean, the outdoors also could be important for 
being able to focus uh, to objects at a long distance, which one maybe doesn't get a chance to do if, if you're inside or looking at a screen at short distance. Yeah, I mean that, that's something which we have learned from the from the Asian countries, which which have much more problems with with myopia as as we have here in Europe. That they like in Taiwan, they have implemented that uh, uh, school children now are two two hours per day they have to spend outside in the schoolyard, not playing with with the smartphone. And this has um, over the years dramatically reduced the myopia uh, progression rate in, in 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 these countries. So I think both in terms of um, stabilizing the tear film, both in terms of um, uh, normal eye development, spending time outside, it's, it's, uh, especially for children, it's, it's, it's highly recommended. Yeah. I can also just add, uh, I work in the building industry and uh, there's actually also a, a, a big problem indoors depending on the light bulbs because some of the light bulbs actually do emit UV race. Uh, so one should be aware, of course, also which one to choose or to maybe have also some sort of a UV filter for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and there are uh, th there is another question from uh, our uh, um, from our audience and uh, is uh, about the problem of uh, thinning of the cornea and what is uh, causing it, uh, and what is there to be done about it? Difficult question. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that, uh, um, there are several reasons. Maybe can, Neil can add on this from the, from the um, experimental uh, level, but I mean, there's certainly uh, inflammation, and on the long-term inflammatory changes in the cornea can lead to degradation of the, um, of the uh, corneal stroma so what what could we do prophylactically is certainly <clears throat> to reduce the level of inflammation as you said before with topical and anti-inflammatory therapy potentially in the long term um, i mentioned this um, this clinical trial on uh, uv um, cross-linking we, we can also do um, other we can also use other approaches to stabilize the corneal stroma against uh, melting induced um, thinning but that is uh, um, it's early early development yeah, I think I, I, I agree, and I think um, what um, we see on the experimental side is, of course, and of course this is noted in patients as well, that when you have a defect, an epithelial defect, of course this could be a trigger leading to, to, to thinning. So supporting the, the healing of, for example, erosions and so forth, supporting the healing of that uh, is important, as well as we see that if the cornea is denervated, so no, n deficit of nerves, this also is another trigger, triggering um, effect that can uh, lead to thinning uh, of the cornea. So again, as Professor Kaus was mentioning, any therapies that will uh, be there to support um, the nerves uh, and the epithelium and the wound healing uh, would be beneficial um, to, to try to limit uh, or prevent uh, melting. Making a step back, uh, there is another question about uh, the uh, lightnings. And so, uh, what do you think uh, about the screens, uh, like, I don't know, smartphones, uh, tablet, uh, PC, and other things like that, uh, for uh, <coughs> the people uh, with an higher age? So, I think uh, to workers and uh, similar. And Dell is uh, asking us uh, if... Uh, um, there are if if these kind of uh, screens uh, can uh, um, create some dim images uh, to eyes uh, and uh, what uh, they okay. can do because uh, mostly with COVID-19 uh, they for example are in uh, smart working and they need to work a lot uh, uh, directly on the PC for uh, long hours. Mm. So I mean the the um, the I think that one can take the fear away that the um, the light which is emitted from the screen, be it from the smartphone or be it from the laptop, is somehow damaging to the eye. So that is uh, that that is not a realistic fear. Um, what in fact can happen, as we discussed before, is that if you work at a near distance, be it at a smartphone or a laptop or whatever, and if you focus for long times, your 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 eyes get dry because you you are working very focused. You, you your blinking rate is going down, 
And that's why we have this office eye syndrome where uh, people working inside with dry air, focusing on smartphones or laptops, have uh, increased uh, rate of dry eyes. So that's certainly a concern in the COVID-19 pandemic because people are are, are, um, are stuck to the um, uh, a smartphone or laptop work, but it's not the, the light itself does not seem to be uh, damaging to the eyes. So there's also no point in using uh, these filters at smartphones for blue light or so. That's that, that's not really evidence based. But I mean, uh, taking a break, looking in the distance, or adding more uh, tear film uh, supplements. That's probably the way to go and to to go outside in between. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. I, I just just say uh, okay. yeah. Uh, what Professor Carson mentioned. Also, taking taking a break is a very uh, good recommendation, and to focus because when we're focusing on a near distance, we are um, straining the uh, muscle, so the ciliary muscle. So in order to have relief, relief, release that, uh, and have a proper accommodation, it's really important to look in the distance. Um, you know, I think the recommendation is every. Uh, 20 minutes or something to you know look for about 30 seconds at a at a, at a further distance um, and of course as you mentioned going outside very uh, very beneficial as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have been talking uh, for now more than ever about Aniridia Net and Aniridia Net will continue um, and uh, we are about in the middle of the action uh, but what can we expect now in the uh, shortest period of time what are the next steps of Anirianet? Well, the work is uh, continuing. Continuing, uh, we have uh, concrete goals. Um, for example, as we mentioned, uh, this um, consensus to have some kind of clinical consensus, and we see here again with the questions from the audience that it is really important to develop a, a consensus among experts on uh, recommendations uh, in the absence of large uh, studies. Um, so, that, so that's something we're continuing on. Uh, register studies is some, an area of interest as well. There are a number of um, European uh, level or, or national level registers uh, in Europe. And uh, one of our goals is to combine the evidence um, based on uh, aniridia uh, from these various registers um, and see what kind of conclusions we can draw uh, from um, patients who have already been treated. So that's another area. Uh, as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we are um, uh, working on uh, some important review uh, articles, which also, it's not just a review, but it also um, extends this to to um, drawing important conclusions and recommendations and suggesting new areas for for, for new research as well. So, th so these are continuing as well. Um, would you like to add anything, uh, Klaus? Uh, I only want to add that we, we hope for uh, in-person meetings in the near future to, <laughs> to, to speed things up and also to, uh, yeah, it's, it's a different exchange on the screen uh, than if you, if you meet in person. So um, we, are, we are in progress, but uh, we hope we can progress um, differently in the near future. Yes, definitely. But at least until then, uh, this was really a fantastic way to to have you and to talk to you about an Net, to exchange some also information and also disseminate information to our patients in the community. I would like to thank you very much both for your time and of course your engagement and, and uh, for your participation in this event. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to thank our technical team that actually was working behind Matteo and Lucia, Irma and Todd that uh, made all this possible. So I really hope that uh, you will join us also at our next uh, webinar, uh, which will be now in the spring. Um, happy Rare Disease Day tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.